Welcome everyone to our first um, CAG webinar of 2021. My name is Lori Weeks and I'm a professor at Dalhousie University and the Vice President of the Canadian Association on Gerontology. And one of my tasks is, is to the pleasure to organize this um, webinar series for the CAG. So as you can see on the on your screen, the um, abstract, um, the call for abstracts is open for the fall conference, so please make sure that you are aware of that. So um, yeah, submit your abstracts for the fall conference. And just a reminder, during the webinar today, you're going to, you will be muted throughout, you won't be able to unmute your microphone. But you are more than welcome to post any questions or comments in the chat box, so please you're welcome to do that. Um, so yes, but unfortunately you won't be able to actually speak. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you today our presenter for this webinar, Verena Menick. Um, Dr. Verena Menick is a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. Her current projects focus on social isolation and loneliness and age-friendly communities. And she is also the Manitoba lead for the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And in this webinar series, we highlight um, the work of people People who have received awards from the CAG and Verena has been recently recognized as a CAG distinguished member so we're very happy to have Verena join us today and um, also Verena has served as the um, vice president of the Canadian Association on Gerontology among many other roles so we're very happy to have Verena join us today and do her presentation on social isolation and loneliness the other pandemic so welcome Verena and you can take it away all right. Thanks, Lori, for that introduction. Uh, let me just check to make sure that my presentation up, is up. Lori, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, and it looks great. Yeah, it should be clear for everyone. And I should mention, too, that we have managed to get the captions working. So those um, you can see that at the bottom of your screen. And the session is being recorded as well. All right. Thanks, Lori. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to talk to you about uh, social isolation and loneliness uh, and whether it's another a pandemic. Um, I wanted to give you, first of all, a brief overview. And now you see it does not forward. I thought something was, ah, there we go. Uh, just a bit of a roadmap as to where I'm planning to go today. First of all, I want to start off with defining social isolation and loneliness, just to make sure that we're on the same page. I want to very briefly touch on consequences of social isolation or loneliness, as well as risk factors. That's going to be very brief. Talk a bit about the COVID-19 impact. And then, though, I want to spend uh, a little bit more time on promise, uh, promising practices. And here I am really hoping that you will, uh, to, you will contribute by, to, uh, by entering or uh, putting some of the promising practices that you see in your community into the chat box. And then maybe we can have a bit of a discussion via chat. So that's the roadmap. Um, let me start off by defining social isolation and loneliness. First of all, it's important to note that there's no universally accepted definition or measure for either social isolation and loneliness. And I'm sorry about that, but I seem to have a timer in my presentation. Um, so there's no universally accepted definition. There are no universally accepted cutoffs to identify those who are socially isolated or lonely. Uh, so when we identify people who are lonely, well, it you know, depends where we're cutting them off. Is it very lonely? Is it somewhat lonely or so on? And there are also numerous terms used interchangeably and inconsistently. For example, social engagement, social inclusion, social support. So sometimes when we look at studies, we actually are not just comparing apples and oranges, but we might actually have an odd banana. Uh, comparison in there as well. So that's always important to keep in mind. Having said that, a very common way of defining social isolation and loneliness are to say that social isolation is an objective situation that relates to the absence of social networks 
Uh, so having or a small social network. So having few people around you, having few friends, having few family members or no family members, no friends or having limited contact with the social network members. So maybe there is a, uh, a friend, but there is very little contact with that individual. Maybe there is a family member, a sibling, but there's little contact. Loneliness, on the other hand, is a subjective experience. It is how we feel about our experiences. And it is an unpleasant experience that results from a mismatch between what we want and what we have. So we may want more uh, contact with others than we actually have. And that leads to the feeling of loneliness. Now, social isolation and loneliness have been talked about for a very long time. We have decades of research on it. And we do have decades of research that shows very consistently that both social isolation and loneliness are health risks. I have pulled up a couple of quotes from articles, uh, one from 1988, which was a review article. And in that article, Hao Zedao pointed out that social relationships or the lack thereof, so that would refer to social isolation, are major health risks. And they equal in magnitude uh, the risks that we see with smoking, high blood pressure, obesity, physical activity or lack thereof. Uh, just over 20 years later, or, or in 2010 rather, uh, a little bit later, uh, almost the same conclusion was drawn through a meta-analysis done by Holt Lundstad, again showing that in terms of a mortality risk, social isolation, in this case it was social isolation, equaled in risk uh, that of other well-established risk factors. Now, we, low, we know a lot of uh, outcomes that are impacted by either social isolation or loneliness. And I've put them here in a kind of an organized way, somewhat organized way, just to show possible pathways between social isolation or loneliness, and then behavioral and affective cognitive effects, such as lack of exercise, worse sleep, less social support, less perceived control, but also physical, physiological responses, so for example, a decreased immune system response, high blood pressure, and others, there may be some brain changes even, and that those may then lead to those health outcomes that we also quite consistently see for both social isolation and loneliness. And those include, among others, increased risk of heart disease and stroke, increased risk of dementia, increased risk of depression, decreased quality of life also is in there. Ultimately, those health outcomes would be expected then to also lead to the premature death that we, we uh, also observe. And that was certainly pointed out in the Holt Lundstad uh, study that I mentioned earlier. So there are major uh, impacts that result from social isolation and loneliness. Let me just give you uh, a, a, one example of the psychological impacts. So, so this is a study my colleagues and I did using Canadian longitudinal study on aging data. And we looked at uh, baseline uh, social isolation, loneliness, and then an 18 month follow up on psychological stress, distress, which psychological distress in, combines both depression and anxiety. And when you look at the percentage of people who experience psychological stress uh, among those who were neither socially isolated nor lonely, it was 8.5%, it goes up a little bit, only a little bit for those socially isolated. Then we have a major increase uh, for those who are lonely. So loneliness really drives that effect on psychological uh, distress. 25% of those only lonely were psychologically distressed. And then a little bit a further increase for those who are socially isolated and lonely. So those would be most at risk then. We also do know a whole lot about the risk factors for social isolation and loneliness. Again, there are decades worth of 
research studies out there. I have listed only a few of the factors. There are many, many more. Uh, age, for example, sex, gender, life transitions such as widowhood. Widowhood is a major, major uh, uh, effect, has a major effect on social isolation, loneliness, physical and mental, mental health. So physical and mental health are both an outcome of social isolation and loneliness, but also a predictor. Uh, low income finances so makes a difference, lack of transportation, low income neighborhoods, so having fewer resources, perhaps feeling unsafe in the neighborhood all relate to social isolation or loneliness. And again, there are many, many more that one could list. Let me give you just a couple of examples of how this plays itself out. Uh, when we compare some of those characteristics, and again, this is using Canadian uh, longitudinal study on aging data. By the way, I should mention, this is a national data set, a wonderful data set. If you haven't looked at it yet, go to the Canadian longitudinal study on aging website. Uh, there's a mass of data available that we can use to answer all kinds of questions. So uh, my colleagues and I, uh, when we looked at social isolation, loneliness, uh, among those 65 plus year olds, 8% were socially isolated, but then it increases a little bit anyway, uh, to the, among those who are a little older, 75 to 85 year old, um, but loneliness, uh, and when we look at loneliness, 11% of Canadians age 65 reported being lonely, but that increased to a, a massively, in my opinion, to 33% among Canadian men who are widowed. So again, you can see those risk factors combining being male um, and then widowed on top uh, and that loneliness is just skyrocketing. So that is a very brief overview of, of social isolation, loneliness. I'd be happy to answer more questions, but I do wanna now go on to COVID. And of course, we all know COVID uh, last year uh, had a major impact on our lives. So when you have a picture of people being together, it almost seems weird, it seems unnatural. We all became more or less socially isolated and then some people also became lonely. Uh, we turned from an in-person world into a virtual world. And when you look at how, um, this is a, a study from Angus Reid in 2020. They, they surveyed Canadians, and this is showing the data for those aged 55 plus. By the way, that is how they show the data. That's a very low cutoff from an age perspective, but there we are. That's what we have. Uh, you can see the increase in 2020 compared to 2019 in the use of video calling apps. And if you combine all the, uh, the various categories, you see an increase from 36% of Canadians aged 55% who use those apps to a 55% uh, to 55%. Frankly, I find that rather low. I would have expected to be higher than 55% in that relatively young age group. So if you have any comment on that, what you think about this number, let me know in the chat box and we can maybe uh, talk about that. Uh, when you look at uh, just Google Trends, I did a quick search on Google Trends to, to the term Zoom. It spiked, uh, not surprisingly, last year when uh, the pandemic started, uh, as everybody, I'm sure, shifted onto Zoom. And of course, right now we are on Zoom. It's decreased again, presumably because most people are now very well um, adapted to using Zoom or other video conferencing uh, apps. Uh, is social isolation and loneliness the other pan pandemic? Well, there, there's not a whole lot of research out on it. Uh, I did a, just a very rough EBSCO host search on the term social isolation and loneliness, and you can see the major increase there that's happening in 2020. By the way, the 2021 decrease, of course, is because we're only into February. There are actually already quite a lot of articles on EBSCO host and other search engines. Um, 
a lot of the articles, when you look at them, are more editorial in nature. They point out that there's a problem, that there's the likelihood of a problem. Well, early on, it was more the likelihood. Now it's we having a problem here, a possible solution. So there's very little research at this point. But of course, there are also many, many media articles, and they come out pretty much every, well, every day frankly, every day. This morning I was reading a, a, a newspaper and again, there's something around loneliness and social isolation, not surprisingly. So if we just go by all that is written out there about it, we really do think that there is a pandemic going on. Now, if we look at the rather limited research on the topic, um, I've, there wasn't much that I could find. Having said that, I know that there's pretty much an article being published every day. So I haven't updated this today. Um, and we also know that there's uh, research being done on social, uh, on research done that will allow us to answer the question, how much of an, uh, how much of an impact was the, uh, the pandemic in terms of social isolation and loneliness? But if we look at just these data, we had in a Canadian sample, this is again the Angus Reid uh, study that they were doing. They were looking at three age groups um, and you can see the steady increase in loneliness. This is now the percent lonely during COVID compared to 2009. And you can see that there's increases. It increases for all ages. In a Hong Kong study, uh, you see uh, an increase from 9% to 28% over time pre-COVID, during COVID. And in a little study we did in Manitoba uh, with colleagues, uh, we also see loneliness uh, in terms of perceptions of loneliness from pre-COVID to, uh, to post-COVID uh, going from 11% to 31%. So quite a dramatic increase there. Um, I mentioned the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging uh, is one study uh, that will be able to uh, allow us to look at uh, the loneliness effect and social isolation effect of the pandemic once that data becomes available. So that will be a wonderful source of information. Uh, let me just highlight one thing in this uh, in this uh, graph, and that is the young age group. Look at the 18 to 34 year olds. First of all, important to note that they had higher rates of loneliness pre-COVID, so in 2019, and then again, of course, post-COVID, uh, during COVID, it also increased. So on the one hand, that suggests that, that younger people are more at risk of loneliness, and that is a finding that we've seen in the literature before. On the other hand, conversely, it could also tell us that older individuals have a resilience. And when you look at what people say, and I'm drawing here on again, a, a study we did in Manitoba, it's unpublished at this point, we ask people about their experiences during COVID. So that was last year uh, kind of just as we were coming out of the first lock, uh, lockdown. And there was a repeated comment around how lucky as a group older adults are because of not having lost a paycheck, not having to worry about little kids. And so, so that gave them a certain resilience. I also want to highlight though that in the first quote, the person mentioned specifically, I'm lucky I have a partner so I'm not totally isolated. The quote at the bottom is another one from a study that was conducted during COVID and an individual who was not uh, lonely, who indicated that they were not lonely, said, well, since I'm bedridden, my life has not been affected by this pandemic. Uh, so life goes on. So again, there's a certain resilience that some uh, older adults will have, older and younger adults, but in this case, we'll talk about older adults. So what has become apparent then is that there's been a polarization of experiences. There's been increasing inequities. So the risk factors that we know 
existed exist for social isolation and loneliness have become really more important even than they were before. And I've listed just a few of these factors that have uh, become really important. Of course, one of them is access to computers or internet. Those who do, those who do not. We've also realized that there's some, or even more realized these days, that there's some people who do not even have access to phones. Those are even more at risk now that they're uh, no longer able to have the direct personal contract contact with, uh, with others, for example, in a drop-in center, or for example, going out for a coffee with somebody. Uh, we've seen increasing gaps between those who are financially comfortable versus those who are not. And again, that ties into that computer access too and various other uh, abilities to access other services. Living with somebody versus not is making more of a difference. Having few problems or disabilities versus having some problems. Uh, being a caregiver is even more important now. Uh, having to care for somebody without now services, perhaps in some cases, on a 24 seven basis is even harder than it was before the pandemic. And then that massive gap we have seen and the tragic um, situation that we have seen happening in nursing homes across Canada, including in, in Manitoba, uh, so that those living in the community and those within nursing homes, the risks have become even more polarized. And again, there are many more examples and you can uh, add more in the chat box if you would like. So I wanted to go on to some promising practices and I, I can only give a few examples, so I will not go over all of the ones that I could talk about. Um, and I will draw here on a project that I'm currently involved in in uh, Winnipeg with uh, with partners, community partners. This is a project funded by the New Horizons Seniors Program under uh, from Employment so Social Development Canada. This project started just before COVID. And of course, because of COVID, just as we're launching, uh, the organizations had to pivot their pro programming. So there has been, of course, a massive impact on all of the programs that are being offered. So let me just give you a few examples. So promising practice, of course, we have seen, I mean, you're well aware, and I'm sure some of you are participating in some of these, uh, organizations have started to um, provide virtual on uh, programming. So online programs, and I've given a few examples here, an active living center, so the Femina Active Living Center, PAL, uh, is providing exercise classes online, but also painting classes online, and the list would go on. A, the Rainbow Resource Center in Winnipeg, this is a, a, an organization for two LGBTQ plus individuals, very quickly, and I was actually quite uh, pleased to see that they very quickly pivoted to being online, and so they have their uh, coffee and chat online. We've also seen the Alzheimer's Society uh, as another example, uh, providing programming online. So Minds in Motion, for example, which is a program that is of course normally in person with a, pers a person with dementia and the caregiver and there's exercise in, is, and, there, and there's some games. So, so, so cognitive stimulation that is now moved online as well. Now, some people have liked that. In our study, when we asked focus group participants, uh, uh, several, many mentioned that this was wonderful. People can uh, do uh, programming like exercises uh, on Zoom and you can hear people, you still get together. But then of course, what about those who don't have access to a, a computer? And here's a quote from a study out of uh, the US where one participant said uh, they answered left out. So they felt left out of uh, community programming that is uh, because they do not have a working tablet to get on the internet from the apartment. 
So again, speaking to that digital divide that we have seen. So a solution then has been to provide computer access. So the Manitoba Association of Senior Centers, for example, uh, through our project called OSEP project as an acronym, uh, has purchased tablets and training for, lower, uh, for older adults who live in a low income senior housing uh, building. And then the tenant coordinators, fortunately there's somebody on staff who can also help out. Uh, we've seen this happening in many places. I know many, many organizations have bought uh, computers, tablets, notebooks, what have you, iPads for seniors to get them online. Importantly, here's the training, of course. What we've also seen, though, is, is the Wi-Fi access is very inequitably distributed. It's, first of all, it's expensive. And since we have lost access to some of the the places where people might have gone to have access to internet, like libraries, uh, and there's not if, if it's not available in a building, they now also don't have access to that. So in this example, um, the tablet these tablets were introduced in low-income housing, which fortunately has Wi-Fi, so people could get online. Uh, another option then has been to go to the telephone, go even low tech, go really low tech. Um, and, and the ANO Support Services for Older Adults, which is a large organization in Winnipeg, has been able to, to do that very successfully. Uh, first of all, with the Senior Center Without Walls program, which was already online, uh, which was already uh, um, a telephone program free of charge. And let me just note that uh, ANO's um, program was established in 2009. So it was a very, very well-established program. It was the first of its kind in Canada, has since been replicated in other places, I know. And so it was easy then to simply expand on that, build on that. Um, and here I've given just a few uh, session topics. It's a diverse program. People call in. Uh, there's a various topics being presented. It's very accessible to those who have telephones. So it is targeted at people who are socially isolated. And the topics, I think, are great, as you can see, vary from Celtic music to making maple syrup. Just a few other programs that ANO has uh, either started or continued. One is the Daily Hello, which was introduced uh, as an add-on to the Senior Center Without Walls very early on in the stage, early in the stages of COVID when we, when we shut down in Winnipeg and there was realization there needs to be some check-in for those who are set socially isolated. So people uh, could call in on a daily basis and uh, there was a, it was an, a way to check up on them to make sure they're okay, that they have everything, all their needs met, but also, of course, to just say hi and have that social contact. ANO's Connect program is normally a volunteer program where volunteers go and uh, visit others um, who, who want it, who are isolated, and that had to be changed to a telephone contact. And then I want to highlight the 311 food security phone line because it just highlights that social isolation and loneliness, that's not the only issue we have. It can also lead to food security issue. People are isolated, they can't go out, they can't go shopping, nobody can come in and help them out. And so in partnership with the city of Winnipeg where we have the 311 phone line, well, we, we can call for information. Uh, people who call that line and who have specific issues can then be referred to ANO, who then can assess the needs and, and has been able to provide a lot of food hampers to people, which is, which is great. So they haven't had to, well, first of all, uh, go out, which has often not been possible. Uh, they may not have anybody who can bring anything in, but also it, it's, it's been a really good way to then refer people to other um, 
services because maybe food is a problem yes food security issues are a problem but the real problem is 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 something else it might even be elder abuse in the worst case scenario so there have been a lot of referrals coming in which just chose to need and i've put in the number here as as over a thousand referrals have been made through that phone line to ano which have then been met in terms of uh, uh, referral to services or providing services Another example is that medical student volunteers are making phone calls. I know this is a program that is in uh, place in other places in, in Canada, and you can tell me about that in the chat box. And then Active Aging Manitoba has just launched a Take a Minute campaign. Uh, this is in uh, has several components to take the minute to move radio campaign where there's clips radio clips to have older adults get active move about because another impact of COVID, as we are well aware of i think all of us is that we're less physically active and that also causes problem so getting people up even just for a very short time is can be of benefit and then they'll take a minute to move together uh built on a peer leader program that they already had, which normally would be in person where peer leaders provide exercise um, programs to older adults. But of course that had to be stopped. But now the idea is that the peer leader will call somebody either via the phone, if that's the only thing they have, or they can video conference if the person has a computer and internet, and then they can move together for a little bit, do some exercises together. And then they've also uh, uh, continued their healthy aging webinar series. So uh, just briefly then, okay, we have promising practices. Those are just a few examples. And again, I welcome uh, any other examples. Do they work? Well, we don't know yet, really. It's soon to tell, too soon to tell. On the other hand, if we go by previous research, and there's a lot of previous research on various online telephone-based uh, interventions or programming and um, many outcomes such as loneliness and well-being and physical activity and what have you, social isolation. Uh, a lot of studies show some benefits, but the big but is a lot of studies also show no benefits. So it depends a bit. Overall, I would say there's benefits that are uh, shown. It depends a bit on the intervention. They vary widely from anything from uh, computer training to having a, a, a robot pet brought into an institution to exercise programs online to, uh, yeah, you, you name it and it's there. Um, so many studies show no effect, also there are relatively few good quality RCTs. I have given a few references. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, I would strongly recommend the Williams et al. article. It just came out. Uh, it actually does a review and then relates the articles in terms of the intervention as to whether it would be feasible during COVID. So if you want one of those citations, go to the Williams uh, 21 article. It's in, published in PLOS One and it's open access. So we have just a little bit of emerging data during COVID. So that's all these review articles from are from pre-COVID. So we can extrapolate into COVID. Yes, there's a few promising results. It's encouraging, for example, Zoom-based cognitive behavioral therapy was effective in reducing uh, loneliness and depression during COVID. So that's good. And that's in line kind of with, with the previous literature. Uh, Cohen Mansfield looked at and colleagues looked at as just older adults uh, uh, perceptions of Zoom-based activities. Did they like them? What, have issues with them and people kind of they enjoyed them. Uh, so that was good. They particularly enjoyed physical exercise programs and lectures, particularly given by professionals. So that's promising. 
And we have just a, a few pilot studies, a couple of pilot studies on that st the student volunteer programming. So these are student volunteers, as I mentioned in Winnipeg and other cities, it's medical students, but in other places, it's other types of students who, who make phone con contact with older adults. So those from the student perspective anyway, were well received. They were thought of as having a benefit but we don't know yet the impact on the older adults. I would imagine that that's what the next step is for those uh, researchers. And we're gonna look at that next. So there's a lot to learn yet. Uh, let me just also note that there's overall few studies with nursing home residents. Uh, so the review studies that I mentioned earlier where there's a lot of uh, literature on, on online or telephone interventions or programming, but that is predominantly with people in the community. Does the same thing work for nursing home residents? We really don't have a lot of information at all. Uh, the very recent Williams uh, 2021 review shows a couple of studies that have uh, where robot dogs and seals had an impact on loneliness. Uh, so that's pre-COVID. So that's encouraging. Not a lot of other research though. Uh, there's a little bit of research showing that video interventions with nursing home residents show some promise uh, in terms of uh, reducing uh, loneliness, but it's also, um, it's also challenging as one can well imagine. And uh, here's a, a, a quote from a uh, nursing home resident in one study. Uh, let me just note this study had a very small sample, so qualitative, and all the nursing home residents did not have dementia. So this is people without dementia living in a nursing home. And so they were trying to use, uh, get them on Skype on an iPad, and as an aside, Skype almost seems quaint at this point. Uh, I think any study right now would go with uh, Zoom or some other platform. Uh, anyway, I like this quote, uh, too much on the brain, too complicated, press this one for that and this little one for that. It's just, I've got to exercise my brain and I'm thinking, what do I do next? And I particularly like the final phrase that I think most of us could very much relate to during these uh, challenging times of uh, a pandemic. My brain is worn out. So with that, I would like to ask you, what promising practices do you see in your community? What is the need? And of course, I'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, I realize I, I, I went very quickly through some areas, uh, but I did want to leave some time for uh, you to uh, give some of your promising practices. Well, thank you very much, Raina. Uh, there has been many comments um, posted. I think you can probably see the chat room there as well. So some people have posted some things that are happening around the country. In some cases, they're, you know, evolving as with COVID and trying out some new things and making um, some services more available to people. Um, there were several questions that had to do with of course, when we have adaptions to programs and using various forms of technologies, there can certainly be some people who are still left out. So you talked a bit about programs that help with access to things like, you know, devices and, and internet. Um, in some cases, people mentioned, you know, in some cases, people might not even have access to a phone. Um, so, you know, that might be an area, you know, to work on as well in terms of providing access to even just that basic form of technology. 
um, like a telephone. There was a couple really good points too around um, what if what if people have different sensory challenges though, Verena? So for example, hearing, you know, or did you know of any any things that are available? Um, because the, if they're all delivered tech, via some sort of technology, hearing would be pretty essential to be able to participate. Yeah, yeah, that's such a good point. It is, uh, I, I think that's where you have seen that 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 polarization, that increasing inequity. So, so here having a hearing impairment already was a was a real challenge, and it's now even getting uh, more of a challenge when you have, uh, uh, well, partly the online, but also the masks. Masks are very it muffles the sound. So. Uh, so, so, I mean, yeah, I, I'm not an expert in the hearing area. If there's anybody there, what are the solutions? I know, of course, there's many adaptations that are already being used. Uh, we have the captions going right now, which is actually not too bad, given that it's, a, uh, you know, just in Zoom, just you can do that. So that can help, uh, but I'm far from, from the expert in, in the hearing issue in the hearing area other than uh, yeah it's 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 marginalizing people the other issue that the the, the comments early around uh, uh around the technology uh it it has made us realize not only even more so i think i think we knew of course that there was the digital divide we knew that we knew some people just didn't have access i mean rural areas still don't have good wi-fi access there is areas, uh, uh, well, buildings, certain buildings for older adults don't have uh, Wi-Fi. But I think it's, it's really highlighted that, that there is this divide. And then the phones, I have to admit, I hadn't really considered that before the pandemic that people would not have phones even. Yet, of course, of course, that is the case. And that's really further marginalized them. And then there's other ways that one needs to interact and it has to be in person not, or provide that technology to them, which again is not cheap. So somebody has to purchase that. And, and I'm concerned as we many of us, of course, are as this pandemic goes on, for how long are people either isolated or for how long does one have to fill those gaps? Sorry, I got off into a different. Yeah, no, that's great. Right. There's, <laughs> there's certainly lots of issues there around access to technology. I think there's also a lot of other comments that have to do with how do we encourage people to participate? How do we get people to know about these kinds of things that might be available, whether it's, you know, the availability of, of technology or, or then just connecting to them? How do we motivate them? And um, you had mentioned in your slides that um, there's a lot of men in particular who are experiencing loneliness and especially widowed men. Um, so how do we how do we encourage people in certain groups? Like how do we get men to participate in these kinds of things? I think there's a perception that women might be more likely, you know, to engage in some of these programs. So um, yeah, <laughs> how do we do that? In any way you can, and that's that's a it's a challenge. It's it's easier for those who are already connected. So those who are connected are once again more advanced than those who are not connected. So, so people who are already members of an active living center, they will be constantly getting information, but those are the already engaged. Uh, those who, uh, so those we know about, um, it's the ones who are not engaged that are the real challenge and and to reach those is 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 the real challenge i think um, something like that 311 food security phone line i find that a really interesting model because this is now calling a, a normal number so it's a 311 number that you might call anyway somebody says i, I don't know how to get food i have an issue where do you call? You probably call 311. Well, one hopes. And I mean, again, it presupposes that there's a phone and there's a motivation there. And from there on, once they get in there, then they can be linked to services. So I think that's a promising approach. So I hope, I really hope 
that a program like that keeps going post pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's always the same challenge. How do you find the ones that are hidden? So those hidden people, those are those are profoundly isolated. Ah, I don't know. Other people might have other ideas. <laughs> There are some really great things that people are commenting on and some examples of experiences and people who have expertise in, in hearing and supporting people with hearing challenges. Um, I actually don't know how to um, copy either. Someone had asked, how do we copy the material from the chat room? Um, Anthony, uh, maybe that's something that you can help us with um, if we can... Um, collect all the information that are, are there and then we can make that available. Okay, so Anthony's replied that we can make a list available um, after the webinar. Of, uh, Verena had asked for people to post your promising practices and you did. So we will, we will make those available to you after the webinar in addition to the recording of the webinar as well. There's some really good examples of things there, Verena, that people are, mm -hmm. are posting about addressing some of these issues. I, I saw I noticed some that had to do with um, connecting older people and younger people. It might be students of various levels. Um, so those kinds of programs might be potentially really promising, Verena. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's I think that's the promising thing about the students, the students phoning. Uh, part of it is what I hadn't mentioned is that also the students felt that there was a really uh, benefit to them because they had that intergenerational interaction. So I'm thinking too, and that's, I, I'm sure somebody has an example out there. There must be something around schools too, doing something. So, so the examples that I've seen were from students, so, so uh, university student level, but I wonder if there's something really interesting happening with younger kids. So it becomes that intergenerational interaction. Uh, I wonder also, are there any programs out there with uh, computer training now that, that somehow that links young and older? So, so if you have any examples of that, that would be uh, really interesting to hear about. Mm -hmm. um, as we were talking about issues with hearing, there's also issues with vision as well. Yeah. You know, there could, could be challenges in helping people to connect with these kinds of programs as well. Yeah, yeah, vision, hearing, mobility. Um, so there's certain, there's no one solution that will fit for everybody there. We need to have multiple approaches uh, and not everything will work for the individual. So the very individual approaches. Uh, so when you think on, during normal times, um, yeah, vision can be a barrier for sure, mobility can be barrier to go out. So, so why a, a program like Senior Center Without Walls was specifically designed to be simple. It's over the phone. So that was well before pre-COVID that that came in. It's targeting socially isolated people. People uh, in rural areas can participate. So, so the people who can't get out of the house, but it's a way of uh, still engaging that is good for some people but it will not work for other people so there's no size no one thing that is going to fit for everybody yeah there's some really good things being posted i'm trying to keep it's hard to keep track of all these things but about um lots of really interesting practice promising practices around intergenerational programs connecting older people and younger people um yeah, so that's there's some good examples there that we'll share with everyone in the list after the webinar as well. Was there anything else, Verena, that you wanted to add more to? I'll try to kind of scan the questions here and comment. There's a lot of interesting things. Yeah, and I can't keep up by yeah. it. <laughs> one, th one thing that I noticed was um, someone mentioned that, you know, in, in the past, when a lot of these programs were being provided face to face, they were very local, you know, provided in a local community in a local center. Um, now we have the opportunity to to provide these in a much broader way. So, you know, it could be something provided to everyone, you know, in a virtual format. Um, 
yeah, I'm not, to, I don't know if I have a question around that, Verena, but it's just kind of interesting and in how quickly, you know, things can change when technologies are involved versus having to do everything face to face. Yeah, it, it, the world has opened up in many ways. So, so that's been a positive. I, I came across a, an interesting, I thought it was kind of an interesting uh, 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 collaboration between Airbnb Airbnb and uh, some organizations, and you can check it out uh, uh, online, you'll find some information, but it's, it's giving uh, Airbnb is facilitating programming from different countries. So, so you could do the, uh, uh, what did I see? I think a salsa, a dance class from, from South America, right, streamed into your house. So it made some interesting connection worldwide between people. So I think that's promising. Um, nationally, I mean, we, we, we have programs, we already had programs that are national in scope. Uh, um, so those can be built on. So it, it does open up a number of opportunities for sure. I, I don't think, again, it's the only way to go. I think there's, there's there's something to be said for local and having uh, local programming, local people who know the local contacts who can talk about, you know, isn't the weather really cold today, now, here, right? And But there's also the, uh, an opportunity for the broader thing, for the broader connections, the worldwide connections, so bringing uh, the world into the, into the home. Mm -hmm. um there was some information provided about, you know, how do we make sure this information gets out to people? Um, do you have any ideas on how to, how to share information about things that are available to seniors in their communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, again, it's the, it's an ongoing challenge. It was, it's not a new challenge at all. This is not a COVID thing. It was before that. Uh, and, uh, that a lot of people don't know what's actually right there under the nose and and it needs multiple approaches that's that's the only thing i can say there's print there's radio tv there's word of mouth is a really important one uh, uh you know i know about this program and so then of course other people some people are really targeted they, they actually go online to look for for programs, what fits, but those we don't really worry about. Uh, there is the um, apartments, like if you think of an older adult apartment block, is there a way of promoting things? But even then, we hear that all the time. Even then, people are right there, there's programming going on and somebody is not aware of it. So it's constant, it's multiple methods. Um, I just noticed in the chat box, the language issue is another layer of, of problem. How do you get the message out in different languages? It's, it's okay if people are embedded within their community. So if they are within a, a specific language community and there's and there's connections there either, let's say for, um, in terms of a, a religious organization, so they're connected so they can find out about things. But if they're not connected to begin with, it becomes really challenging then to, uh, to reach them. So it's one of those big ongoing problems that uh, we have not resolved. Are we ever going to? Well, I hope so, but I don't know. There's some interesting examples posted about using quite old technology, such as radios, mm -hmm. you know, delivering things on radio, um, you know, because of COVID and, and the reach that that can have for people. Um, yeah. I see that someone, Andrew, has his hand up. I don't know, um, Anthony, how we can, um, I don't think people can be on mute during the call. I think we have to use the chat room, I believe. Um, but yeah, the other radio, I, I, I do think so too. Yeah, and, and I mentioned Active Aging Manitoba, their radio campaign, they're, they're going and, and the Manitoba Association of Senior Centers, a and actually also uh, are on a radio program. I think that's, that's one way, that's one mean, 
means to, to target people. I think it's really good. I also uh, probably the locally, I'm just speaking now locally, we could do more with TV, some of the local access TVs that used to be there. So local programming. Um, but in no, as, uh, just to reiterate, th there's no one silver bullet. It's not going to be one approach will reach people and it'll be an ongoing multi-method approach that we have to use. Mm. There's a few examples of, or, or suggestions of people made around providing information through various essential services that are do have to remain open during COVID. So like, you know, through hospitals and healthcare settings where people might end up, unfortunately, and, you know, that might be a, a place where information can be shared about what might be available locally, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. One of the things we are trying as part of the um, this social inclusion project, uh, the New Horizons project, uh, we're doing here in Winnipeg uh, and there are many other projects like that across the co uh, country um, but we're also trying to train um, gatekeepers so so professionals or individuals in the community uh, to to identify those who are socially isolated and then they would refer to a and o support services for older adults so so the identifying saying recognizing there's a problem there. I think this person might be socially isolated, but then also having the ability to refer that person to a place where they then uh, can assess what the real needs are. And from that assessment, then target the specific services. So the services might be uh, like a, a connect program. Maybe they need somebody who visits them. That would be one option. Maybe they they could go to an active living center. Maybe they could go uh, uh, to, uh, maybe they need counseling. So maybe it's more in-depth. So, so that's one approach we're trying to, uh, we're trying out. We're gonna be trying out. We're just starting on it. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's targeting key people in the community would already have regular contact with older adults, such as a pharmacist. And I th think maybe that's kind of relating to what that person uh, in the chat box mentioned. Mm -hmm. There's just too much coming in. I really <laughs> Yeah, it was great how you included in your in your presentation, Verena, both people who are living in the community, but also people living in some sort of a care home or a congregate setting, where there can also be issues around isolation in, in a congregate setting as well. Um, especially with, um, you know, visitation policies being drastically changed and, you know, limitations on even movement and connection within homes as well. So it's not just people living in, in the community, but, but people in, in some sort of a, a residential care facility as well. I mean, just a note here, one of the interesting things about the pandemic experience and what also makes it a bit of a challenge in terms of comparing studies the few studies that we have is that the timing of when you ask people questions really makes a difference so are we just in lockdown are we out of lockdown are we what kind of lockdown and so so just thinking about the nursing home uh, situation where early on there were very strict visiting patterns um, uh, policies and then those get got a little relaxed but not you know so so things change so it'll be very difficult well we'll have to be teased apart what is really going on here what 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 were the circumstances when we actually uh, tried out different programs interventions and when we when uh, more broadly, when did we actually look at social isolation and loneliness, like the prevalence? Because that could very much change. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely. Well, I want I think we're uh, at the end of our webinar now, Verena. I wanted to thank you very much for agreeing to participate in this. This is obviously a very important issue right now that um, you know has evolved and changed with with the COVID situation definitely. So we really appreciate you sharing your expertise and and research results around these issues. And we've had such a, a great discussion in the chat room and Anthony will help us compile all of these this great information and resources and have that available to you and we'll also post the recording of the webinar webinar which will include Verena's slides so we'll make sure that that's available um, to people who would would like to view that um, after the webinar did you have any final things in closing Verena to say no but I look forward to reading the the, the chats there because I could see only a fraction of them. <laughs> yes, thank you all very much for participating in our webinar. Have a great day, everyone.